Hi everybody, I'm Vincent Racaniello for the American Society for Microbiology. I'm here in Boston, Massachusetts at Boston University attending a meeting called Emerging Infectious Diseases A to Z. It's sponsored by the university and it's in celebration of the opening of the NEEDLE, the National Emerging Infectious Diseases Laboratories, which we visited four years ago on our documentary. And at this meeting, I've asked a few people to sit down with me and talk about their work. And my guest today is Jenna Jana Maze from University of California. Davis, thanks for coming in. Thanks for having me. You're missing a little of the meeting, so we won't be too long. Okay. Thank you. So your laboratory, from your talk this morning, is interested in discovering as many as possible of all the zoonotic viral pathogens that are out there in the world that we don't know about. Absolutely. How do you do that? Well, we've been working with the governments of about 35 countries over the last seven years. We're in 30 countries currently. Mm -hmm. And we partner with the, the country governments and NGOs and universities in the countries what, that we think are hot spots, that mm -hmm. all of the data in the world is telling us are the hot spots for uh, spillover of viruses mm -hmm. from animal reservoirs into people. So what, what are some pathogen. of those hot spots? So it tends to be the tropics where mm -hmm. We see high human population growth, mm -hmm. uh, high biodiversity, so the, the sources, um, the reservoirs right. are in high numbers and um, diverse. Right. And then where we're seeing ecological disturbance, like land okay. use change. So do you think that there are other places where a new virus might emerge that you're of not course, looking? Of course, of course. And we can't look everywhere all at once currently with mm -hmm. what we're doing. Um, we're funded by U.S. Agency for International Development. Mm -hmm. So the choices are, there are many choices and they are narrowed somewhat by um, USAID's right, investments right. as well. Uh, what we've been able to find by working with those governments in those countries mm -hmm. is that, that there's a huge need for capacity development in the area of surveillance and mm -hmm. pathogen detection and discovery um, and also control, right? Sure, and sure. so in the first phase, we, we did 23 outbreaks with governments hmm. in, but in 10 countries in the first five years. And so it really brought home the fact that those countries need to have the capacity to do this themselves. Right. So you, you don't just walk into a country, you help them set up Absolutely. To to so things. ongoing training, mm -hmm. um, all of the pieces that this laboratory that we're mm -hmm. celebrating uh, is really highlighting, and that is mm -hmm. we have to do these things in biosafe, biosecure ways. Right. Um, and and what we've been able to find is that there are, there is a lot of virus out there. There's mm -hmm. a lot of virus out there that is discoverable. It's discoverable um, with fairly low amounts of resources in the countries with mm -hmm. technologies that exist now, and those technologies will continue to get better. And while we're just working in those 30 countries now, we mm -hmm. do think that it's providing a proof of concept that we could, as a community, a scientific and um, public health community, really actually understand the whole global mm. virome of zoonotic viruses that could spill over into people. This is really about a community, not anyone's lab, right? Absolutely, not any one yeah. lab. I'm happy to celebrate this one, <laughs> um, but certainly I have one too, but I'm not sure. talking about my lab. Yeah. Um, I'm talking about us as a community working together uh, mm -hmm. around the world. So in practical means, what do you do? You collect specimens from animals and have them deep sequenced? Is that how it works? We do. We, we use a couple of different platforms. So mm -hmm. we go, um, again, we look at the capacities in the country, what they're able to do, what, what's affordable, efficient okay. in the countries. Um, and we've, together with our UC Davis and uh, Columbia University partners, we first developed a, a system by which we do consensus PCR, conventional, lowest resource need, right, um, right. easy to train. Um, and we can uh, deactivate samples, not put anybody mm -hmm. at risk. So that's our first line right now is the conventional PCR consensus based. And that way we can pick up the viruses that are already important, public health concern, right, right. also discover at the same time using the same platform. Okay. And by doing that, we've, we've found about a thousand viruses in those countries. So these new viruses that weren't seen before? Yeah, 800 of them are. Okay. Yeah. So give us a rough idea. How many 
And these are all mammalian viruses. Mammalian viruses, for, right? mammalian hosts, right. and then um, some in humans. Okay. Um, so we look in the reservoir hosts, and mm -hmm. then we look in humans, and we're trying to detect sharing so right. that we can right. see how often these spillover events are actually happening that sometimes lead to hmm. disease, sometimes don't. Right. And as right. we saw with Zika, we want to know more about those ones that do spill over but don't necessarily cause severe disease until something changes, right, because right. those are the ones to watch. So give us a rough number. How many total uh, potential zoonotic viruses do we know of right now? Well, we only we know <laughs> of less than 200. Mm -hmm. um, but what we believe is out there is closer to the order of 500,000. 500,000, mm -hmm. which is probably an underestimate. I would Definitely. Bet. It's, it, that's based on the number we anticipate mm -hmm. to be in zoonotic families. So families right, of viruses right. that, so there could be families we haven't discovered yet. Sure, um, sure. But based on the number of viruses we think are in zoonotic families and from um, mammalian and water bird hosts, we think they're probably uh, on the order of 1.3 million, mm -hmm. maybe more, mm -hmm. but not all of those will be able to jump of course, into humans. Of course. It's very really interesting. At an ASM meeting a couple of years ago, I asked someone from the CDC who was on a panel, do you think it would be worthwhile to know all the viruses that are out there that infect mammals mm -hmm. so we might be able to anticipate? Mm -hmm. And he said, I don't think that's very useful. Yeah. yeah I think well, you would it's agree. a controversial you would point. I do disagree. <laughs> I disagree for a few reasons. Mm -hmm. One is I think we continue to uh, do the same thing mm -hmm. over and over mm -hmm. again. We see an outbreak. We may or may not decide to invest in that virus. We may or may not decide to try to mobilize vaccine if it's right. a known virus or build right. a new vaccine. Right incredibly expensive, time consuming. In general, we tend to get the vaccine out too late right. um, or not at all. Yeah. Um, we uh, have wonderful scientists here with ASM and here in, in, at this meeting that are doing a wonderful body of work. Uh, and those will help for therapies and vaccines. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But really what we want to do is put the data in their hands, put the viruses in their hands so that they have a bigger set of information right, from which right. to pull to do a right. better job. In fact, some of the discussion this morning after your talk revolved around not just having sequence, but studying the viruses. Exactly. That's not something you do, right? Well, I do in collaboration, but I'm an epidemiologist. Mm -hmm. I'm not a virologist. Mm -hmm. um, and um, we, we do quite a bit of the work, but everything we do is transdisciplinary. So we bring in all of the folks mm -hmm. that we can think of uh, yeah. that would be able to contribute to the issue. Sounds like a line from Star Trek. I'm an epidemiologist, not a virologist. <laughs> I could see Bones saying that. So during the, the session this morning, you also talked about who's going to pay for this and how much is it's going to cost. Yeah. Can you tell us what that, that price tag is? Yeah, so we could we could try to find every single virus. Mm -hmm. the, the bottom line is that it is a big number. So if we wanted to find almost all the virus, that number gets smaller. Mm -hmm. And it's around $3.5 billion that would be needed to go around mm -hmm. the world, especially focusing on those hot spots. Right. Um, and detect all the mammalian and water bird viruses. Now, we could argue whether or not we need to do that everywhere mm -hmm. and whether we could narrow that. But I think what's important is to realize that three and a half billion, while it's a big number, is a tiny number compared to what we spend now to mm -hmm. um, worry about and prepare for pandemics right. and then to respond to them. Right. And this is spent, you said, over a 10 year period. I, I think right? that a reasonable time scale to get it done would be over a 10 year period with mm -hmm. investments rotating so that you spend about a five years in each location right. looking for those. And viruses. to be clear, we're not talking about the entire globe, we're talking about the hot spots, right? As you said. Yeah. I, I mean, you could argue either way that you yeah. would miss something. I think the the heaviest investment should go to the hotspots mm -hmm. um, but there will be countries that want to participate that might not be a hotspot sure, I think our sure. country maybe should know what, what it has right, and right, we're right. not really a right. hotspot and, and the cost should not just be the US but distributed over exactly. countries that can afford it right countries that can afford it I, I mean what we are seeing right now is is we are one globe right and sure. what happens <clears throat> in what we used to think of the deepest corners of the earth are get to our country, get to yeah, yeah. the entire world. And so 
Um, what happens in every other place happens to us or is at risk of happening yeah. to us. So yeah. that means those countries that can't afford it, it behooves them to think about public health on sure. a global sure. scale. I think you likened it to a genome project. Mm -hmm. right? You have to give specific goals. We're going to do this in 10 years. We're going to get this number of viruses because otherwise it's hard to sell to the political bodies in Absolutely. various countries. Right? Absolutely. So if you, if you just say we want an ongoing forever to understand viruses, of course, every mm -hmm. virologist wants to do that, right? It doesn't sound yeah. um, a, achievable. Uh, so what we wanted to do is an achievable project that provides the basis and the raw materials for the work that could go on right. and should go right. on. Um, but it is an achievable goal with a finite dollar amount and right. a finite right. timeline. As someone mentioned, unless you give it very specific goals and a finite time, as you say, you risk losing public confidence. Yeah, and this one's a tough one. It's yeah. a tough sell for public confidence. And I think what we heard today was the human genome was a tough sell for yeah. public confidence. It was, it and, was. And um, people, there were a lot of naysayers. And mm -hmm. in the end, there were just a few donors instead of a huge number right. of donors right. that invested. And for their investment, not, not their own profit, but the world's investment, they saw orders of magnitude um, sure. uh, return on that investment. I must say, I was not a uh, <laughs> proponent of the Human Genome yeah. Project. So limited in hindsight because we know so much and still it's only a little bit of what we've mined in the genome. Right. I mean, the simple fact that 8% of us is viral is amazing, <laughs> which we didn't know. And there's so much more. And so the same will come from viruses. As David Quammen said yesterday, you, don't, you never know where you're going to find something. And you have to look everywhere. To it's look really everywhere. an exciting time, isn't it? It is an exciting time. I, I guess what's most exciting to me is that you can make these investments, and as you go, mm -hmm. you see improvements. So yep. you see countries beginning to be able to detect and diagnose virus. That means they can decide and have informed surveillance plans. Mm -hmm. That means they can determine where they should have hospital beds like we didn't have for right. the Ebola right. outbreak. Um, all that happens way before you even get to 10 years, right? So as you go, you see these huge benefits, much like right. we didn't anticipate but did happen with the human yes, genome. Yes, product. and it really spread over 10 years. It's not a huge investment. It's 1%. Really it's, it's the, the annual cost spread over 10 years is 1% mm -hmm. of the annualized dollar risk estimated by um, the uh, World Bank of what right. we, we spend right. now, what we spend now on epidemics and pandemics. So how do we move forward to having this a reality? Well, I think what you're doing right now, I appreciate it. <laughs> I think getting the word out and um, having people think about it, mm -hmm. have the scientific community debate right. and say, yeah, this part's worth it, this part isn't, how should we spend investments, having that open, dialogue um, sure. about these investments is hugely helpful. Yeah. Um, also, m helping people to understand that it's feasible, both in cost and technology. Right, right. Um, and, and I think, frankly, and this is the, the sad part, I think all of us, as citizens of the Earth, are tired of, of being scared <laughs> of the next epidemic or pandemic. Yeah. We're tired of having it bombard us um, when something happens, and the horribly huge amounts of money that we spend that are inefficiently spent because we didn't sure. prevent things. Yeah, you think about what was spent in Western Africa for Ebola, right? right? That could have been prevented. Yeah. It's very exciting times, and it's amazing that it's, science gets driven by technology always, right? Always. The technology improves and allows you to do things you couldn't do. Is there anything important that I've missed that you want to say? Oh, I, I think just that we need to be working together to, yeah. again, bring the disciplines together to not only find out what viruses are out there, mm -hmm. but what are the circumstances they're circulating in? Are there preventive measures we can put in place as we go, as I mentioned, mm -hmm. behaviors mm -hmm. that are palatably changeable? Right. Um, and then which viruses are most risky? And that's going to take the scientific community to come together. We're going to throw out kind of a straw man and say, mm -hmm. this is what we think. Um, and we're expecting a lot of right. dialogue, conversation about that. Um, and we'll have to have thick skins about that. But yep, I think, think be honest with each other and try yeah. and make it make the world better. I've been speaking with Jonna Maze from the University of California at Davis. Thank you so much Thank for taking you. the time. Yeah.
and good luck. Thank you <laughs> to all I'm, of us. <laughs> I'm Vincent Racaniello. I'm from Columbia University, and I'm speaking with Jonna for the American Society for Microbiology. Thanks for listening. Thanks.